Welcome, everyone. Whether you're tuning in morning, noon, or night, we are glad you are here for another episode of Cloud and Clear, SADA's Cloud Transformation Podcast. I'm Michael Ames, Managing Director of Healthcare and Life Sciences Professional Services at SADA, and could not be more excited about the guests that we're bringing to you today. From Form Bio, I'd like you to welcome Chris Hawes, Head of Partner Engineering, and Doug Daniels, Chief Technology Officer, here to talk to us today about some amazing things that they're doing in genetic engineering, in bioinformatics, in scalable cloud, and all kinds of exciting things. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Hey, thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Really glad you're here. I think we need to jump right in and address the elephant in the room. <laughs> or should I say, the woolly mammoth. Uh, Form Bio spun out of a company called Colossal that is doing some really interesting things. Tell us first about that before we dig in to what's happening in FormBio specifically. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we initially uh, formed a company, Colossal Biosciences, like you mentioned, out of a scientific endeavor and partnership with Harvard uh, around this really interesting uh, project to de-extinct the woolly mammoth. And uh, with that, they're also looking to explore how that technology, uh, they have to invent new science and new technology to be able to even approach that type of problem, that massive mammoth sized problem. And, uh, you know, they want to use that technology that they developed to leverage, um, you know, other breakthroughs to apply to the conservation and issues around the world for endangered species. And where we came from out of that was we were building essentially the genomics, the bioinformatics data platform to analyze these massive data sets, these massive genetic and genomics uh, problems that they were trying to solve. And uh, what we realized was this platform is even bigger than that scientific endeavor and that we wanted to expand. Uh, and that's where we spun up the company. That's awesome. And we're gonna dig into what Form Bio's sort of expanded remit is. But because, but because I know the listeners are curious, okay, so in Jurassic Park, when they wanted to resurrect some dinosaurs, all they did was like, took a syringe to a moth stuck in some amber and sucked out some DNA and stuck it into something else and boom, we had a dinosaur. It sounds like a, a process that should be fundamentally biological, something that people are doing in wet labs with, with white coats on, but you're doing something here uh, in, in silico on computers, right? So, so what is it about this, this genetic engineering process that, that, is, that demands the kind of platform that FormBio is producing? Yeah, so there's a, there's a really interesting uh, sort of challenge in the biology and genomic space in the last 10 years uh, where technology um, around sequencing DNA has become even more high resolution and detailed. And what that means is the data sets are getting larger and larger, hundreds of gigabytes, uh, terabytes for analyzing different genomic samples. And so what happens or what we're trying to do uh, with Colossal is they are taking ancient DNA samples from tissues that they dug up in you know, Siberia and uh, that DNA is not complete. And so it's kind of broken up, degraded, it's in pieces. And so what they're trying to do is sequence that DNA and then put those puzzle pieces together, referencing, let's say, one of the living relatives like a African or Asian elephant and aligning that to kind of fill in the gaps to kind of create this uh, de-extinction process uh, and move forward. And so it's a really big data problem, right? This high resolution data sets, these massive analysis that needs distributed clusters of compute GPUs to analyze this. And so it's, it's really a big data and cloud problem uh, that they need to solve. You know, what's so interesting to me about that is that you're describing, you know, this problem of, of lengthy strings of data that have gaps in them, that have uncertainties, lots and lots of it, and you're predicting what should be filling in these gaps, what should come next. It starts to sound a lot like a large language model, like we're seeing behind ChatGPT, Gemini, and things like that. And, and you are doing some work there, only what you're doing is a little bit different from how we usually think of LLMs. That's right, that's right. We, we are leveraging technologies that are analogous, uh, but are taking DNA sequences, building a large language model that's been trained on DNA nucleotides to predict uh, sequences that have certain characteristics that we're looking for in the cell and gene therapy space, for example. Uh, 
And so it, it is a very similar sort of application. And DNA is a language. It codes for proteins. It codes for behaviors and functions in the cell. And so it is it is a very similar process to natural language that we speak and we write. So you're, you're literally training a language model, but instead of feeding it with a corpus of, let's say, all of Wikipedia and Reddit, you're feeding it with a corpus of relevant DNA sequences. Back if anybody who remembers the movie Gattaca, right? So G-A-T-C represent those four little nucleotide molecules. And, and they all happen often with repeating patterns, certain kinds of things cluster together in similar ways, just like languages do. But that's what you're training on. You're literally feeding those sequences into the transformer model and creating a language model that speaks the language of DNA. Have I got that right? That's absolutely right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and then taking that and, and kind of combining it, chaining it together with other downstream analysis once we've predicted that to kind of validate or introduce other optimizations and things. Yeah. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to say that, like Doug, Doug just stated, there's ways of now you understand the patterns because you've trained uh, a large language model to understand DNA and how it generally forms. You can come up with ways to optimize that. When you think about uh, doing drug discovery, drug optimization, um, you want to make sure you have the opt optimal design of the drug you want to insert into the human body. Uh, so you want to have reduced toxicity, for example. You want to have, when you're manufacturing, you want to increase the yield as much as possible, which helps drive down costs by understanding DNA, being able to do those predictions like we would do with natural language, you're going to come up with a more optimized drug that you can bring to market. Yeah, I mean, this is amazing. And so you've taken something that was initially developed for this idea of literally resurrecting a woolly mammoth. And now you're taking those same concepts and pivoting them. You've just talked about drug optimization, drug discovery. Tell us, Chris, a little bit about who are some of the companies that your product and platform is now is now targeting. Yeah, um, really anyone uh, in the small, midsize, uh, large biotech, large pharma, they're all uh, generally folks. So initially we started with uh, gene therapeutics, um, specifically RAAV based uh, delivery mechanism into, into the body. So it's a vi viral vector, as we've seen similar to the COVID vaccine, very similar in, in concept to how you deliver that into the body using a viral vector. That's the AAV portion of it. And uh, gene therapies is this new realm, cell and gene therapeutics. Like everyone uh, has probably heard about small molecule. That's most drugs on the market align to that. But the cell and gene therapy area, because of the advancements in th synthetic biology, is this up and coming area that they believe will be the, f the future. They, meaning like a, the life sciences uh, industries and researchers, because of the way it can effectively cure some of these genetic diseases. I mean, you're effectively editing the human genome to replace a, 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 a gene that's not operating correctly with a corrected gene. That's a gene therapy. So we focus in that area. And those customers I just mentioned, uh, or the, the industry I just mentioned, they all have teams that are focused on these cell and gene therapies because that is the future. Uh, that's awesome. Let, let's get to the technical bits now. You're building this platform on Google Cloud. I should say it's operating. It's in production. You've got some amazing customers. Uh, tell us what drew you to Google Cloud for this work. Yeah, so you know, Google Cloud as a ecosystem of cloud services is really attractive to us in terms of being able to rapidly deploy our infrastructure, uh, leveraging a lot of their sort of data services like BigQuery that is just a, a, a wonderful ecosystem and service that's been growing and growing uh, for analytics data, for uh, doing any of our large scale ML models, uh, pulling from that, and and so you know, I think it's just it's just well positioned for the types of work that we're trying to do, uh, as well as the partnership um, with Google uh, and channel partners. And Chris can kind of talk to some of that too, as to why we are uh, leveraging the Google Cloud platform. And, and recently, uh, you know, GCP Marketplace has been a, a really uh, excellent uh, sort of opportunity for us. We're launched on there. You're able to sign up. Uh, we have a free tier. You can use and explore our bioinformatics tools. And so it's just been a very, you know, excellent ecosystem, both from the core infrastructure, the services, and go to market. Yeah, I'll just add that um, the thing that I love about GCP is that just their opinion and approach on how to do managed services and, and serverless platforms. So another, you know, you know, Doug mentioned BigQuery, serverless data warehouse, no maintenance at all for us. Uh, behind the scenes, when we're doing these HPC um, executions, we're using just a bat, we're using Google Batch to be able to just spin up 
whatever number of VMs we need scale out or scale up to execute and run those workflows, the bioinformatic workflows, and then container management. I mean, Google's done a great job of, of really having a strong opinion on how you do Kubernetes and containers and be able to use Cloud Run, just bring our, our containers into that platform, let Google manage it, spin it up, take it down, and uh, reduce the overhead for us, for the engineering team has been really critical. You know, I think what you're talking about here resonates with a lot of the folks who are listening here and a lot of Sada's customers who are in a similar space to where to where you are, which is essentially a, a technology company in service of a specific industry problem. And you're growing, you're growing fast. You have some things that differentiate you. That differentiation, though, is in your knowledge and understanding of the bioinformatics, of the genetic engineering processes, of the drug discovery processes, of the statistical algorithms that back all of this. It's not necessarily, although you're very good at this, your differentiator, what's going to get people to go to form bio isn't, wow, you did a great job with the underlying infrastructure, right? So for, for an organization that's growing, how important it is, is it to you um, that your own engineering team is able to focus on those higher order problems and just sort of defer some of the underlying underlying uh, infrastructure challenges up to the cloud provider? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, y you know, our engineering team, we want to have them focused on building and combining and orchestrating these experiences that resonate with uh, the, the biotech companies that we're engaging with and also kind of co-developing some of these things with those companies so that we're able to kind of fit the processes and the data and the analysis they're looking for as we discover the processes and the science that is needed to put this together. And we have an incredible scientific team, both on our uh, R&D AI ML team that is building the core machine learning algorithms, the DNA BERT, the large language models, our bioinformatics team, which is world class. Uh, in terms of the the bioinformatics algorithms and workflows that they're orchestrating and putting together that's just like incredible, incredible analysis and able to rapidly develop. And, and really what's awesome about Google Cloud is that we're able to build a SaaS platform that allows our team members to deploy rapidly these innovations, these bioinformatics workflows, these AI ML models, and get them into our customers' hands and you know, kind of getting the, the technology out of the way, right? And just delivering the science. Yeah. 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 And I love that you know, it's the technology and, uh, as Chris was talking about in GCP Marketplace, mechanisms for getting it out into customers' hands, letting them click to deploy. Um, helping with simplified contracting models and things like that. The, the ecosystem, it sounds like, is providing you with good tech and a lot of other good things attached to the tech. Yeah, I'll just say as, as uh, you know, kind of my role, um, you know, working with Doug and the engineering team that, that he's built, um, the nimbleness that they have to be able to pivot around based on them using Google Cloud technology as an enabler for that, for them being able to, I mean, world-class team, knows what they're doing, but to be able to move very quickly because the services are just that easy to use and mature our platform more and more as we advance things to then enable the scientists to deliver that, you know, really that differentiated value on top of the platform. Outstanding. I'm, I'm going to ask you in just a second here about what you're working on now and kind of where you're going next. But, but first, I want to tell you what I would like to see come out of this. Okay. Can we genetically engineer, now hear me out, toy woolly mammoth. <laughs> All right. Now think about it's a it's a woolly mammoth, but it it stands about three feet high. You can keep it in the backyard. It's hairy. It can live there all winter long. I'm in Colorado. It won't mind the snow. It can take care of the grass, and the little kids can go for rides. Like, don't you think that would be amazing? <laughs> that would be super super cool. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, you know it, it's a wild world what can be explored in sort of the genetic engineering space. Now that we're able to uh, you know help facilitate these genomes for animals. You know, we got to the human genome and that cost a billion dollars. We're able to develop genomes for every vertebrate species, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And so that gives us the the pieces, the blueprints, right, of life to, you know, start exploring that space, which can, can be exciting and a little bit scary. <laughs> I mean, it sounds to me like you're going to have that ready in a year. I'm, I'm looking forward to it for next year. That's Christmas. right. Yeah, I just wanted to add that Colossal on our platform, um, they have sequenced for, for the first time sequenced the entire genome of the Asian elephant, right? That's the nearest living relative of the mammoth. So they know what makes an Asian elephant look like an Asian elephant, including things like size, 
So now when they start mapping the mammoth to that, it, what makes it have small ears versus big or a small trunk versus a, a big trunk or hair, fur. Um, size could be some component of that to you know, order your three foot tall, five foot wide woolly mammoth. My backyard mammoth. Yeah, I appreciate you guys working on that. Back to the technology. Tell us uh, what you are working on now. What's new and exciting? Yeah. So one thing we've we've known. So we brought we're bringing in these uh, you know AI models to understand DNA to uh, these uh, biotechs and and uh, big pharma that are doing early stage uh, drug discovery and, and drug optimization. The thing that we noticed, not surprising uh, as we're all technologists, is that um, they all have data problems. They all have process management problems, right? Nothing nothing abnormal from any other industry. I mean, everyone has reams of data they need to manage, and they're in some stage of maturity of being able to do that effectively or not. So because we recognize that they have data all over the place, I mean, literally, spreadsheets, meeting notes on uh, Google Drive, OneDrive, other... Yeah, I mean, just... And then you have reams of data in blob storages across multiple clouds, potentially. So we're building a, um, when you think about the actual drug itself, the DNA, the RNA strand in gene and cell therapy, they tend to call that a vector. Um, that's the sign, you know, sign, quasi-scientific term for that. And um, they need to manage, you know, every drug candidate has many, many vectors that they're designing and analyzing to decide whether they go forward and try to manufacture it. Um, and they struggle to, to manage that whole process. So we're building a, a tool for vector uh, management design and intelligence that we're calling vector flow to uh, enable them to just more effectively do that. And then our AI component is, is an aspect of that. Okay, I want to, I have this vector and I want to optimize this vector. That's where the AI component comes in. But generally they have a, now a nice centralized tool for, for uh, having the, the executive view on down to the wet lab bench scientist view of where the state of their vectors are. I love that. And this is what I love about technology companies like you is there are companies out there trying to move the needle on cancer treatment, diabetes, heart disease, any number of, of, of difficult, rare diseases. And they're they're aware of the problem that they have in data that you just described. But like you, their differentiating thing is their knowledge and understanding of the disease and shouldn't have to be how do we create technical platforms to let us study it. So what you're doing is you're creating these technical platforms that are going to scale out into the industry and ultimately are going to help drive discovery and innovation that's going to affect and improve health and health care for all of us because of being able to give them that lift, that 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 boost using this um, using all the exciting technology and vector flow sounds very cool. And the timing is good. And I'll say as a, as a biomedical informatics guy, Bio people were using the word vector way before LLM people were. So you're welcome, LLM yeah. people and data scientists, for that term to aptly describe data. Yeah, um, everyone says, is, if you think vector, everyone thinks vector graph databases. No, we're right. not talking about that here. Right. We might leverage something like that as a technical underpinning, but we're, it's a different thing. We've been doing vectors since before they were cool, I'll put it that way. Uh, just, I, I can't tell you how, how great it's been to spend this time, dig into what you're doing, the technology what's differentiating about you, how you're using Google Cloud. Um, Chris and Doug, I wish you the absolute best in this endeavor. I think you're making the world a better place. You're making it a more exciting, a more interesting place. And, uh, and I hope that Form Bio just continues to grow and expand and see some, see some great successes. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thanks, Michael. Thank it's you, been Michael. great. It's been a pleasure. And for those who are listening, thank you for joining us for Cloud and Clear. Be sure to subscribe, like, upvote, whatever the icon is on your listening or watching platform of choice. And we will see you again with another episode in a couple of weeks. Thank you for listening to Cloud and Clear. Check the show notes for links to this week's topics. And don't forget to connect with us on Twitter at Cloud and Clear and our website, sada.com.